Well, uh, Greg, first, thank you very thank much you, for sir. being here. Pleasure. Uh, we're here at Cincinnati State. These are young uh, students who are pursuing a firefighter degree, an EMS degree, and with those degrees in hand, an associate degree, hopefully they'll land career full-time jobs in the fire service. That's so, great. So thank you very much. And thank you for having me. All right. Okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it says up there, the Protective Security Advisor Program. Uh, really, that's, that's not really labeled correctly. It should say Protective Security Advisor Services. I'm going to talk to you specifically about what we're providing for products and services technical assistance for critical infrastructure owners and operators, okay? Uh, before I do that, though, if I can go to the next one here. Oh, yep, I'll get over there and work it. Okay, I'll let you do that, so you know how to do it. i got to tell you about who I work for. Has anybody ever heard of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency? A few people? It's pretty new. Probably, I, I don't know if there's any agency that snuck up on me in here in the last year, but from November 2018, that's when this agency was formed. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. That's all right. I can talk through this even if we don't have that. Uh, yeah, like I said, fairly new agency developed out of what's called the National Protection and Programs Directorate, folks. Uh, I, I'm reluctant to always put up a mission and vision statement slide because people's eyes usually glaze over when they see that, which I think we're coming back to in a minute. But. I think it's important. This is probably one of the best. I've been in government for almost 34 years, all right? And I've lived through a lot of mission and vision statements, okay? Some of which are like multi pages long, they look like. This actually describes what we're up to in this agency that I work for. You know, we're basically partnering with industry and government to understand and manage risk critical infrastructure, our nation's critical infrastructure. That's what we're all about, period. And Greg, prior to 9-11, this did not exist. That is correct. The whole department didn't exist. 9-11 was the catalyst for the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, which is what CISA refers to, or the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is part of that. Vision. Ultimately, this is what we want, a secure and resilient infrastructure for the American public, or the people, the United States. So, really, direct, straightforward, we're all about critical infrastructure protection, and resiliency. Next slide. Okay, this is how we see ourselves as a nation's risk advisors. Uh, we're charged with leading that effort to understand and manage critical infrastructure risk. Uh, we work in cooperation with the public and the private sector to do that. In fact, the vast majority of critical infrastructure in the United States is owned by the private sector. Over, they say over 80 percent. So we're working closely with them. Uh, one of the things, though, as part of our agency, it be, it's easily to under, easy to understand that, the cybersecurity piece, is that we're charged with providing the, basically the, the technical assistance to safeguard our nation's network, governmental network, federal network, the .gov network. But we work well beyond that, as I just indicated. We're working across multiple sectors of critical infrastructure, both public and private sector, to provide that same type of assistance by way of cybersecurity tools, incident response services, as well as security assessments, uh, the capabilities for that. I work predominantly in the physical security realm, but we work in both. One other thing that's not mentioned oftentimes is our work with emergency communications, which you folks are all going to be part of that if you're not already. And we did a class trip to the 911 center. Outstanding. Well, this goes to the heart of that. We focus on promoting interoperability across all levels of government. I don't care if you've been through any exercises, actual incidents, what's the one thing that always comes up as an issue is communications. And what we're trying to do is promote that interoperability so that when incidents occur, both government officials and the first responders, such as yourselves, are going to be able to communicate effectively to execute that response. So we're involved in that too. Go to the next one, please. All right, I've talked about critical infrastructure. What am I talking about? Well, basically, it's any asset, system, or network 
that by virtue of the fact that if it's incapacitated or destroyed or no longer operational, that's both physical and cyber, that could lead to a debilitating effect on our national security, our economic security, public health and safety, or just American way of life. That's what we're talking about. Okay, next slide. When you think about that, what do you think about what, what would constitute critical infrastructure? Well, I'll go ahead and say what you're thinking. Typically, when we think about like energy, right? Electricity, natural gas, petroleum, stuff down here. Water, wastewater, fundamental stuff, right? Transportation, roadways, rail, maritime, and communications. Those are kind of bedrock, what we call lifeline critical infrastructure. And that's where people's minds go to most of the time. But there's actually 16, what we call 16 sectors of critical infrastructure. All right. The, the, the one thing that's beautiful about the job that I do as a protective security advisor is I don't just work with one of these. I work across the board in the whole 16 sectors. And what, I, what I think is really unique about this is the fact that we get quite a different perspective. I wouldn't say we have a 50,000 foot level perspective. It's more like the 10,000 foot level. If you're working at a power plant one day, a water plant the next day, and a stadium arena the, the following day, you start to get this a really kind of a broad spectrum view of the dependencies and interdependencies of critical infrastructure. Cascading impacts, when something bad happens over here, what happens over here? It could really come in handy, especially during incidents, because you're able to basically understand those cascading uh, impacts and link up the people that work across these different sectors. Next slide. All right, I'm only worried about terrorism, right? Yeah. Not really. Sort of. It's a high priority. Terrorism's why, like he just said, it's why DHS exists. It's a focus of ours, is, uh, terrorism as far as uh, hazards go, or threats, I should say, in that case. However, we're really focused the entire threat landscape because let's think about it. If you're hit by a tornado, hurricane, something man made happens, something blows up as a result of some technical issue and that infrastructure is down, the consequences can be very similar, right? Tremendous impacts for certain types of infrastructure being down. So we're actually focused on all hazards, like many of you will be, or if you're not already. Uh, we're telling the owners and operators of, of critical infrastructure, do an inventory of what the hazards and threats are to you, and then take action to try to make yourself more secure and resilient. Next slide. All right, now to the, to the, I guess you would say the thrust of this, or what, of what we're talking about. First of all, protective security advisors. We are basically critical infrastructure security and resiliency specialists. Uh, there's about 100 of us, a little over that, maybe like 107 of us right now in the field, actually in your communities, reaching out and working with critical infrastructure owners and operators. Background? Okay, well, here's the gist. I guess if I had to boil it down to the background of the folks, most of them have either a military, law enforcement, private sector security, or emergency management type background. Me? I'm an old Coast Guard guy. I spent just under 23 years in the United States Coast Guard. That's why somebody said something about boats earlier. I'm really interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's my background. I came from that. So I had a smattering of everything but that whole private sector security. I didn't do the private side, but did the emergency management, the law enforcement, because Coast Guard has, a law, has law enforcement uh, roles and responsibilities, as well as obviously military. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we come from or what, we, what we're about. Now, what do, we, what do we try to do? We try to be that link between those owners and operators of critical infrastructure and the Department of Homeland Security and bring in services to them. That's what our role is, predominantly. One thing I want you to think about here, though, with us, we are not law enforcement or regulators. Totally voluntary. So when we go out and work with these folks, we're working in collaboration with them saying, hey, here's some of the things we see, the potential vulnerabilities, here's some of the things you may want to think about. So we do not mandate, we don't come in and say, you shall do this. I can't tell a person at a stadium, you need to make sure you do this type of screening. I can indicate, hey, I think that this is a good practice that you do. But I think it's an advantage there too to that though, is that 
the folks you work with do oftentimes see you as a true partner and trying to help them out. And Greg, I, I have the pleasure of serving on the LEPC, Local mm -hmm. Emergency Planning Committee. Sure. And from that, I've come to learn that there are some high hazard chemical companies in our area. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be a service that you could reach out to? Well, we actually have those who are not, those who are under the realm of what we call the the uh, chemical facility anti-terrorism standards, we have specific folks who deal with them because they are regulated, those that have certain chemicals of concern, you know, because of their toxicity or explosivity. Uh, so those folks, those particular facilities are dealt with with that, and that is a regulatory element. They're working in partnership with those chemical facilities. There are some facilities that are outside that realm that I would be working Got with. It. And of course, we're we're right above a major rail line now. Absolutely, here. So you imagine are. Imagine what's going up and down that rail line. You got a and rail line. Down that I seventy five. <laughs> absolutely. High risk. Yep, absolutely is. Okay, so next slide, if you would please. That just kind of gives you a force laydown of that hundred over a little over a hundred where we're at. Okay, if you're from Southwest Ohio, I'm your protective security advisor. Ohio has three of them. We have one in Columbus area, that central part of Ohio, and then up in the northeast. Uh, but you can see there are some places like Texas, high concentration of critical infrastructure. California, large state, high concentration. Florida, New York, that have multiple protective security advisors. We have at least one in every state in the union, as well as Puerto Rico that handles Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Hawaii being a state, they handle the islands over there, Guam, Marianas. Next slide. So relatively small bunch. Here's, here's, if you don't remember anything else that I talk about today, this is what I want you to remember. This slide here, what we did. Okay, first of all, surveys and assessments. We do these physical security surveys and assessments. That's everything from a two hour, what I call a walk and talk, where we go out with a representative of that infrastructure and we walk around and we look for vulnerabilities. And then I say, hey, that looks like a vulnerability. Here's some options you may want to think about to enhance your security and resilience. And he sits there and notes it. That's it. Now we have a much more comprehensive survey called Infrastructure Survey Tool. It takes about a day or depending on the complexity of the facility, maybe a little bit more than that. In-depth look at the protective measures of that facility as well as what it's dependent upon. From that they get a report as well as some dashboards, interactive dashboards to help them enhance their security. Again, all voluntary uh, vulnerability options and uh, for consideration. Well, so unlike a fire department that may come to my law firm and say, I want an exit sign up here, and then guess what? Two months later, they come back to confirm that I've done that. You're in a different mode. I'm in a different mode. I'm going to come to them, and in fact, typically with that survey I just talked about, I won't be back for another three years unless there's major changes or something that they want me to come back and look at. But again, I hand it to them, I say, hey, you are managing your risk. You know what resources you have, you know what you should do as far as what your priorities should be. And I, we leave it to them. But I'm always gonna tell them too, if you're regulated by anybody, you better do what they say to do. Nothing I say takes that precedence over that. So, for example, fire safety. I talk a lot about egress uh, as far as putting up ball, bollards, putting certain types of locks on doors. But one thing I always caveat it, because you folks are going to be in this realm, is I talk to your fire safety officials before you do anything because there may be certain codes that you have to meet. So that's a good point. So we do that. Outreach activities. Well, we take a look at the data and what's going on in the world, and sometimes we focus on one particular sector or subsector than another. Let's think about one thing we're doing right now when it comes to an outreach activity that I'm engaged in. Soft targets and crowded places. Does that make sense, why we might be focused on soft targets and crowded places? We have somebody here from the Montgomery County area that understands that probably just as much as anybody right now. With the date and shooting. Right? With the date. So, so we're doing some outreach with those facilities that are basically don't have as many layers of security. You think of a Fort Knox uh, bullion depository. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Multiple layers of security. Hardened target. We're looking at the softer ones and going out and doing outreach with them, saying, "Hey, here's what we got for you. 
a lot about what I'm talking about here, to help promote your security. Special event support, you may not think about that, but yeah, we do special events before they're going on and, as, and when they're on, going on. Beforehand, we go out and do security assessments. Yes, sir? What does soft target mean? Soft target means that just those places that typically don't have that type of layered security. E like I said, easier public access, so to speak. No screening, perhaps, or limited screening. Yeah, or a convention center that's, hey, we're having another convention. Every day there's another convention that's coming in. Easy access. Virtually no security at all. Uh, you know, and there's a gentleman here that works for the library side of the house. Think of that. If you want to think about something that's easy access, everybody just walks in, they do their business, right? And go to most places they want to. So those types of facilities, mostly you'll see a lot in the whole commercial facility sector, even some stadiums, arenas, what does it take? It takes a ticket, some do screens, some don't, things of that nature. Uh, festivals and events like that that are open. Um, so it's a broad spectrum. The Harden being the other side of the house, like I said, much more layers of security in place. So, so for special events, like I said, we'll do uh, security surveys and assessments for the venue, for any kind of other facilities around that that may be supporting the event, as well as we'll look at dependencies. We may do an analysis to say, hey, what do you need in order to operate here, and where's the single points of failure? We need to understand that. that might interrupt this event, as well as training. And I'm going to talk to you about training here, what we do. Uh, before that, incident response. Bad thing happens. Big time something goes wrong, whether, whether it's a natural hazard, terrorism, whatever. You oftentimes see us report to emergency operations centers to fulfill the role it's called ESF 14, Emergency Support Function 14. Does anybody have any clue what that refers to? You probably don't because it's new too. Within the last the All-Star game came to Cincinnati, the Regional Operations Center up here on the hill was absolutely packed with officials. And that's, that's in my case, that's probably where I'm going because I cover southwest Ohio, something that, especially in Hamilton County. But for incident response, we will be in that generally report to emergency operations center fulfilling that ESF 14 role, which is cross-sector business and infrastructure is what the title of it is. What are we doing? We're trying to figure out, okay, what infrastructure has been impacted by this incident? Think about the tornadoes that went through Dayton. Think about what was impacted there. I had to think what, what was impacted, what critical infrastructure. Also, what's the consequence of that? What are the direct impacts as well as the, cons the cascading impacts from that event? And then try to help those in leadership positions make some decisions about when they're responding for priority, priority for restoration. So that's what we're there for as well as reporting to our chain of command to make sure they're aware of what's going on. And Greg, and that last one with the bombing prevention, uh, two of my sons were down in Atlanta, all right, and they heard the first bomb go off. Yeah, the Olympic Park. At the Olympic Park, and, and maybe because their dad was a firefighter, they knew to leave that area because that was the first bomb to go off, to draw emergency responders in and then have the second bigger bomb go off. Yep. You always got to be thinking about that secondary, what might be a target. I have a question. Um, so you say you provide uh, like voluntary <coughs> uh, like, like aid, so if you see a problem that they don't have to fix it, is your position, is this a career position or is this voluntary? My position yes. is a career position. That's a good, good question. I already addressed that. Yeah, I've actually been working as a full-time person in this job for, for over 10 years, for about 11 years. So I'm a full-time federal employee. So all of us are that do this particular role. There's also similar folks in the st at the state level that do a similar role that I do. And they're also uh, full-time employees. So it's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't think is about there, it. Is also, is there only like 107? Is that like the maximum capacity for the people in your position? Well, right now that's how many billets I believe we have, and I don't want to quote that exact number, but we're pretty close to that. And then we have about 10 people that do supervisory role over those 107. Right now that's what it is. I don't know if there may be expansion, you never know, based on what's going on in the world, and, and the, that's uh, you know, a decision for, for those above me to make. But right now that's where we're at. 
and it's been right, right around that hundred number for some you know some time. So what he said something about bombing prevention and awareness. I want to talk about another thing that we provide. Uh, first of all, active shooter. Obviously, wherever I go, I ask him, "Hey, what what are you concerned about?" It could be I don't care what it is. It could be the water plant. It could be a retail facility, for goodness sake, whatever. And they're always going to say the workplace violence and active shooter, active aggressor. So we do training on that. You know, basically a run, hide, fight. If you've heard of that use, we do a lot of that type of training to enhance people's preparedness. And we also do like workshops for them to do planning. The owners and operators of critical infrastructure to plan for that type of event, establish plans. Uh, bombing prevention. We have a complete branch focused on bombing prevention. Why is that? Weapon of choice. It's cheap to make. There's all kinds of instruction out there on how to do it, isn't there? You can get the, uh, the precursors oftentimes fairly easily and it has dramatic impact. Well, I'm, I'm on their webpage now and I've been seeing these training invites, not only in Anniston, Alabama, but in Detroit and elsewhere, there's a lot of training. There's a lot of training, and it's available. I'm kind of a conduit. I go, you come to me and say, hey, I want this kind of training. Now, what, what kind of training do we have? Well, first of all, we've got online training, do bombing prevention type online training. There's also a virtual-led instructor training, a virtual instructor-led training built. That They're only like 75 minutes long, and they're, you, anybody can register for them and take them to where you have an instructor up here who's probably got an, uh, an EOD type background, explosive ordnance detail type background or special forces type. Somebody with that type of the background in bombing prevention who's actually leading this course, 75 minute courses. Awareness courses, uh, we've got, well as far as classroom, we have classroom courses too that we put on that we do everything from general awareness, bombing pre prevention awareness, IED search type courses, vehicle borne IED search, protective measures courses, as well as surveillance detection courses. We actually teach that too, what behaviors to look for and what to do when you encounter uh, suspicious behavior. Most of those courses, the ones I talked about that are virtual courses, they're like 75 minutes long. The other ones that are brick and mortar, like you're sitting here today, typically one day long at an eight hour course. Surveillance detection, up to three days. That's a three-day course because it has a lecture element as well as a go, let's go out in the field and let's try to reinforce what we learned in the classroom. So quite a variety of courses are available, especially to first responder community. We, we try to cater to the, as well as those who have security responsibilities in the private sector. And Greg, uh, I hate to bring up the topic, but it's an important one, and that is voting and voting security. Okay, well, yeah, I'm glad you did because that's another outreach. Yeah. Okay, obviously since 2016 there's been quite a bit of focus on election infrastructure, right? In fact, it was made a subsector or a sector of critical infrastructure that we focus on. We've done a lot of work, especially on the cyber side of the house as well as the physical side of the house. We've worked very closely, if you're in Ohio, with the Secretary of State's office. Actually, we've been out to every, I believe every uh, county Board of Elections in Ohio. Yep. Okay. Doing doing the physical security assessments as well as providing cybersecurity uh, tools and services to help promote that election. We want our elections, the integrity of our elections, to be maintained. Uh, Ohio is really at the forefront, I think, in my mind. I'm biased, but yet I think we really are uh, in trying to preserve that, and we're we're there to to, to help them with that effort. So I'm glad you brought that up too. All right, next slide, and I think that should be my last one other than who I am. Now here's something I think you folks, we talked about outreach. You folks that are going into the work that you're gonna do, I would hope can help us with this. We call it the hometown security, uh, home, uh, home, homeland security, hometown security outreach initiative. And basically what we're trying to do is get people at the deck plate level, the critical infrastructure, involved in their own in the hometown security by connecting with folks like you, first responder community, law enforcement, fire, EMS, right up front. They all, you know, you've heard this cliche probably already. You don't want to be exchanging business cards when the bad things happen. Something goes boom. 
get to know you folks. Also, you get to know their operation, the layout, the facility. They get to know how you're going to respond. Plan. They need to be planning. Everybody hates to do planning, but it's important <laughs> to establish how do they do their security? How do they do an emergency action plan? Or what are they going to do when bad things happen? And how are they going to recover business continuity? And do that working with you guys. Train, critical. And you're, you're, I probably don't, I don't tell you guys about training because you do a lot of training. But we want them to train their people, make sure that plan works, so do drills and exercise. Invite the first responders out to be part of that, to make it better. Go back and revise those plans and report. Suspicious activity. See something, say something. Educate the workforce on that. I always say I can go and tell you how to make a place look like Fort Knox. I can tell you. If you got, all, if you got a lot of money, we can make it happen. But the biggest bang, and this is a bad, it's not a pun for the buck, is going to be educating your workforce, getting them tuned in on suspicious activity, have a security focus. I think that's where you really get a, a really return on your investment for doing that. So that they know what to do to report suspicious activity before bad things happen. And that's pretty much it. Next slide. And that way it'll show you how to get a hold of me. If again, if you're in Southwest Ohio, I'm I'm the person to get a hold of. I used to be the Kentucky. Somebody said they're doing something over on the other side of the river. I did Kentucky for 10 years, but now I'm over here, and there's two of us, uh, two others that I can get you linked up to if you're outside Southwest Ohio, as well as basically any other state in the union. So thanks for the opportunity, and I'll entertain any other questions y'all might have. How about a round of applause, huh? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. Thank you.